Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, Guided Trip Fly Fishing Podcast. This is Cameron Rhodes here. We got another episode coming at you. Um, I get together with Kevin Alexander, Dr. Kevin Alexander, and he is professor of biology at Western Colorado University, and he specializes in entomology and stoneflies. And I thought it'd be a good idea to bring Kevin on the podcast and talk about stoneflies and the process of stoneflies and a little bit about what stoneflies have to play in the Gunnison Valley and also around Colorado. But we have a good chat. Um, Ryan McVeigh joins us, which is awesome. It's great to have him on. Um, give his little two cents in and we talk a lot about bugs we talk about some fish and you know a little educational podcast for you guys it's out of the norm i know we still drink some beer and have a good time but uh check it out it's a great podcast i enjoyed it um i appreciate the hell out of kevin alexander for coming out and doing the podcast for us and i i couldn't think of more. It was it was fun hanging out with him and shooting the shit with him. And I honestly wish I could have recorded some of the stuff we talked about before and after the podcast because it was it was great. I mean, it was it was too much fun and we, we had a good time and it was super informative. I was kind of out of my element, which was good because I don't know enough about entomology and bugs and science and all the big terms he uses so it was great to listen to him talk about it and ask questions and for the first little while I was kind of just dumbfounded um but it was good good listening to him good talking with him had a blast thanks Ryan McVeigh for joining us on the podcast as well um it was definitely harder than expected to try and get three people to talk on the podcast. So it's a little echoey at times, but, um, you know, we're working on it. We're still a small production, but it was great to try and do it. So bear with us. Um, we're working on making it sound a little bit better for everybody, but, um, Again, it was just good having all three of us on there. We're still working on it, guys, so bear with us. It was fun. And you can you can find me on Instagram, either at the guided trip or at Cameron Rhodes. You can email me the guided trip at gmail.com if you have any questions please send in all your info all your comments all your questions we want to do a comment section at some point or i'd like to do a comment section at some point where we you know take listeners questions comments anything they have to say and shoot the shit about it a little bit because it is interesting we have heard some interesting comments from people and uh it's pretty entertaining but Listen to this podcast because it's a good one. Um, thanks again. So I got to meet him and hang out with him and stuff like that. And uh, uh, we did a radio show afterwards. So he was on a lo- that closer. He was on the cool. local radio station and uh, live on the air. This is my claim to fame. Here. Right. <laughs> live on the air, he said, "Tell you what, Kevin Alexander has giant, huge rhino balls." <laughs> <laughs> that's your ten to start. Uh, that's yeah. awesome. So that's my. You know, quote, you know, yeah. my claim to fame. Yeah. That's cool, though. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I, it's an interesting book for sure, though. Yeah. I mean, that's an awesome story. Um, well, yeah, I guess we're recording. You don't have to wear these. I'm just going to check the sound every now and then, but. Um, okay. 
Yeah, why don't you, I mean, just tell us who you are, introduce yourself a little bit, um, and then I can get into kind of the stuff I have I have written down. But okay. Go for it. Introduce myself? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, who, who are you? I'm uh, Kevin Alexander. I'm a, a biologist, and I've been working at Western Colorado University for going on 19 years now. Uh, my background, where I did all my PhD and a lot of my undergrad work, uh, primarily working on stoneflies throughout that. I had the uh, uh, fortune of working with uh, Dr. Ken Stewart, uh, who's my major professor. Got to travel all over the country looking at stoneflies. I actually stayed in Pitkin as nice. uh, a lot of during the summers, did a lot of my uh, first research projects on stoneflies were here in the Gunnison Basin, and then that branched out to working on them all over Western United States. Uh, never got to travel to Japan or Eastern uh, Eastern Russia, but one of the groups I worked on occurs over there and whatnot. So, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, Ryan McVeigh is here as well. Good to be back. People know Ryan okay. McVeigh from the podcast. <laughs> But he's here. Here, I'll move this so that you can both you can hear us both, just in case. Um, but basically, I mean, we've been trying to connect for the last couple of weeks, trying to talk about. I mean, I've hit you up a little bit, and we, yep. finally we've got to connect. Um, but I wanted to sit down with you and just BS about stoneflies and Great. stoneflies around Gunnison Valley, around and just what you know. I mean, I just kind of want to pick your brain a little bit, and whatever whatever comes out comes out. I mean. Um, so that's what we're doing here with Kevin Alexander. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you're primarily focused on stoneflies? or Well, you know, that's where I started. Probably one of the most spectacular organisms on Earth are, are stoneflies. <laughs> <I'd agree>. uh, <laughs> uh, they're, you know, just really badass critters. Uh, love studying them, love looking at them, playing around with them. You know, uh, I'm involved in a lot of aquatic things, um, you know, Fish are spectacular too. Um, and you fly fish quite a bit. I do fly fish. I don't get to fly fish quite a bit. I'd like to fly fish a little more than than I get to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, all of us, I guess. <laughs> right. yeah. I'd like to fly fish yeah. more too. <laughs> so you know my, that uh, gave me a really good basis, and you know I do a lot of stuff. I, I really work on a lot of landscape type stuff now. You know because what happens on uh, in the watershed ends up affecting what the stream is so work on a lot of wildlife land use planning type of stuff um you know uh this kind of some public lands initiative i've been working on that for probably the last two years plus uh, <clears throat> also working with uh gunnison county on this sustainable tourism and outdoor recreation committee so <clears throat> as i've aged you know, I work on students, getting them in the field and <laughs> getting some passion and understanding right. uh, the beauty of the world out there. And then a lot more of my personal work has been a little more into the how do we how do we keep uh, beautiful landscapes out there and how do we live and function well on those landscapes. Definitely. And without, I mean, without that stuff, where would be, we be, you know, I mean, that's yeah. where we all like to enjoy our time when we're yep. not working or even if we are working, you know, right. we, we yeah. all fortunate enough, all of us get to work outside yeah. for yeah, the right. most exactly. part right. and be in beautiful parts of the area. So yeah. that's, that's cool that, I mean, that's a good yeah. thing to have for sure. Right. Um, and we're, and you know, we're talking about, you know, protect the environment, you mm -hmm. know, habitat sustainability, things like mm -hmm. that. And obviously, as you know, um, stoneflies are a really good indicator species of how yep. well an environment is done. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, ha habitat's everything, right? right? And, you know, for a stonefly or whether it's a mayfly or caddisfly or a midge or whatever, they have very specific requirements on on... Uh, what they like, what they don't like, you know, they're susceptible to some types of change and then other types of change they can handle pretty well. And so when you start looking at all the different critters that are living in a river, right, they, they can tell you a story about what's happening, not just in the river, but in the whole watershed. Because right. if you change, you know, land use in that watershed, you're changing 
you know, uh, food sources, you're changing micronutrients, you're changing pollutants, things like that. And so all of those types of things end up affecting organisms slightly differently. So when you look at the whole aquatic system in there, you can see what's happened in the watershed, good or bad, right? So, um, you know, Cameron really wanted to talk about the giant salmon fly, uh, Terranarsis californica. I do, but I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. open to anything. So oh, to th- this yeah. kind of r- rolls into that a little bit because they historically used to be here and used to be very common in the upper basin and under what's now Blue Mesa Reservoir. Um, somewhere early 1970s, you know, based on all the historical records we have, they disappeared from the upper basin. Um, you know, people come from all over the world now to go down to the Gunnison Gorge and the Black Canyon and hit that stonefly hatch. What used, where it, and that used to be up here uh, under Blue Mesa Reservoir and then all the way up through town up to Almont, right, historically. And we don't know what caused them to, to disappear up here. Uh, there's Theo, speculation. There's speculation. I mean, so Theo Colburn, I don't, if you're not familiar with her, uh, very famous. She did the, all the research on endocrine disruptors, you know, uh, hormone mimics that cause birth defects and things like that. And she did all that work at the University of uh, Wisconsin. But she entered into science a little late in life. Uh, she was a mom, everything. I think grew up in Paonia, I believe. but ended up getting her master's degree at Western. And she looked at, you know, these salmon flies and looked at metal pollution and how metal pollution out of uh, some of the abandoned mines uh, outside of of Crested Butte affected them. And cadmium seemed to be the big thing. And what cadmium does for a stone fly is it prevents them from molting. Right, so if you're unfamiliar with insects, right, they they grow as they get bigger, they shed their exoskeleton, and that's a process called molting, and uh, they're kind of vulnerable at that stage, and cadmium uh, disrupts that process for them, and so they can't molt, and if they can't molt, they die, right? So one of the hypotheses is maybe that cadmium did it. There's hypotheses that maybe some insecticide use did something maybe it was big land use change you know they don't have that large woody debris and things like that that might uh, be a necessary component for the food food source so they disappeared at some point in the past um so we're interested in why and maybe with some of the cleanup on some of the abandoned mines up in uh outside of crested butte well maybe you know, we don't have the metal loading and the cadmium and stuff right. like we may have historically had. So I had a student, Clayton Bondurant, who worked with him for a bit. And Clayton's a game warden out of Sawatch now. Oh, I know Clayton. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bondo. Right? So uh, he worked on, we, we took some cages, a little, uh, I don't know, maybe about, what's that, about six inches around and a foot or two long. And we took some some of the big stone flies out of the, the giant salmon fly out of the Gunnison Gorge, put them in these cages, put some in Tamicha Creek, some in the Gunnison River, left some as a control back down in uh, the Gunnison Gorge. And we looked at molting, we looked at survivorship, we looked at emergence from that to an adult. And what we found was that for the most part, they could survive and molt into adulthood um, in these cages in the Gunnison River and Tamiji Creek. And then the other thing Clayton did is he took some of them after the project was done and ground them up, did some uh, analytical chemistry on them, looked at see if they were bioaccumulating cadmium, things like that. And we didn't find any real evidence of that occurring. So based on that, we thought, well, Maybe if, it, if cadmium was it and the metals were it, then maybe it was uh, some of that loading and things like that. So that's how we started with the potential reintroduction project. Right. 
So, because I mean, on the Arkansas, what I did a little research on mm-hmm. when they did the reinter- reintroduction in 2012 on the yep. Arkansas, they were very concerned about mining and metals and yep. thinking that it wasn't going to work. And so, back in I believe it was the 90s, they did a lot of work to make the river cleaner without yep. you know, and a lot of different um, projects on the river to help clean that up a little bit. And so, but. In the research I read, they they weren't seeing much. Even yeah. they did a three year reintroduction project and weren't seeing much at all. Right. And they don't know really what to attribute that to. And we're getting that to uh, getting to that a little sooner. But this That's is awesome fun. that we can talk yeah. about it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, because then, we're we're in the same kind of area. I mean, we had a lot of mining go down in Crested Butte. Right. Same with them in Leadville and yep. out in that area. Right. So. So it could be a habitat thing. You know. Once again, you know, trying to get a population of. When there might be tens and twenties and thirties and thousands that are needed to establish a good functional population, and you're trying to bring up maybe a, a thousand individuals or a few thousand individuals, that may not be enough with you know just normal mortality and that transition and stuff may not be enough to to support them. And one thing we were doing, you know, once again. Uh, we're going down. We were going to the gorge. I got a bunch of Trout Unlimited folks to volunteer, and a bunch of students at Western volunteered. We went down. CBW helped us out. You know, took us across on boats and coolers and trucks and all that kind of stuff to be able to haul some up here. And uh, we did that for a couple of years in a row. You know, we had some adult emergence here. Whether that's enough for them to mate and right. make some populations. So that turned out to be a you know a big ordeal. This is a lot of investment of time and money and effort and resources, right. and whatnot. Uh, so one of the things that I started doing after the fact was you know if you're transporting a big live individual, you could be bringing in all kinds of potential invasive stuff. Right. So after that, I went down and started getting. Uh, some of the big females and just getting the egg sacs off of them, putting those in some vials, bringing those up here and then releasing the eggs to see if we could reintroduce those. Is, uh, is that on your own time? Or that was on my own time. Okay. Yeah. And then, because, you know, in all reality, what was taking us, <coughs> you know, 20 people a whole day and travel and all that kind of stuff. It's great to have people involved and, right. and getting them working on rivers and, and seeing some products and things like that. But I could go out there and by just grabbing some egg sacs off, you know, maybe 50, 100 females, right. I was bringing up on my own by myself you know, maybe 10 to 100 times more. It than, wasn't such a big production. It wasn't yeah. such a big production. And the chances of transporting a potentially noxious critter from one body, you know, we're in the same river system. Right. And that was one of the things that I really wanted to concentrate on was, you know, the chances of there being a problem from a lower part of the Gunnison River to the upper part is probably not that great. You're in the same body of water. Right. Uh, and people travel back and forth. My, my chances of introducing something are, are virtually non-existent. Slim. But... Even eliminate that some more, but just grab some egg masses. Right. Yeah, stuff like that. So, yeah. So, uh, overall, um, over the course of, uh, of this, reintrodu- this reintroduction process, how many salmon flies do you think you did potentially reintroduce to the Gunnison Valley? Oh, I've got the numbers written down in my office, and I, I can't remember them off the top of my head. But, you know, I'm probably thinking ten to 20,000. Okay. Something like that. You know, egg survivorship... You know, uh, insects, you know, you have a lot of eggs. You don't get a whole lot of early, what, uh, an instar. And the instar is that, uh, that each life stage of an insect is an instar. Exactly. Every, every time they molt, they molt into a different instar. So those numbers decline as you go through. So you got a big funnel right you're trying to get that big uh, opening to the funnel and then so you have a few that come out yeah. right same thing from you know fish, fish. egg to yeah. to adult same fish thing. egg to adult right you got a lot of eggs not many make it to adult exactly right, right? um so yeah play around with that a little bit and so trying to increase the mouth of that funnel right and the best way i thought to do that was with eggs right and i, I could do that with the least amount of effort 
you know, we do, we've had a few reports of some flying around and some people have seen a few. Uh, I haven't gone out and done any searches to look for, you know, uh, how many adults are coming off and things like that. So, yeah. And we, we talked about it a little bit before we started the podcast, you know, like before getting into you into it, I said, "Ah, you should read over my notes a little bit and check Mm -hmm. it out. But, and I don't have a ton of salmon fly experience. Like I said, I, I haven't been down to the gorge. I haven't witnessed it. I, most of the time I'm, I'm working and I can't get down there when something's happening. And you it, should go. Uh, I know. I need to go check it <laughs> you out. You should go. Or but you I should go see that hatch yeah, somewhere. Exactly. Somewhere. It, it um, is absolutely a spectacular biological phenomenon. It's just incredible to see. I'm always thinking about it. I'm always trying to make it happen. Yeah. You know, I know on the Rio they have one as well. Yeah. And The Rio's a good um, one too. Colorado has one. Colorado, but, um, Colorado has better <clears throat> density than uh, the Gunnison does as well, far as of, density of, of salmon flies? Of, or? of density of salmon so flies. So speaking of which, do you mind if I chime in here real quick? So <laughs> historically speaking... Um, and, and I don't know how much you know about this, but how did, um, how did the upper Gunnison's hatch, salmon, Taranarsis hatch, compare to that of, you know, the legendary Deschutes and Madison yeah. rivers? How did, the, how did those hatches compare? You know, uh, you always get historical versions of stuff. And, uh, pe- you know, people's memories are fickle and they change <laughs> through time and they morph and stuff. But you hear, like, really spectacular stories of you know all the willows along the Gunnison River just completely covered and alders completely covered with with uh, salmon flies which is very very typical uh, when you get those really big hatches you know right. they're just covered they're crawling all over you it, it, it creeps probably some people out but yeah having a big uh, this giant insect crawling up your neck and up your pants legs and all over your face and stuff like that but uh, man well, I think, it's I think uh, we're in the classic that's sexy. <laughs> it is. I know. It's uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's just you know half half the fun. You know, you're seeing all these big fish coming up and taking these big stone flies okay. and stuff. But then they're crawling on you and you know on your hat. And, you know, you wake up and they're over your sleeping bag and stuff like that. It's just. So, I mean, we we hear stories. We got a we got a buddy Nick Danny who um, yeah you know wouldn't mind know you know Nick yeah. Nick yeah. Um, mm-hmm. he wouldn't mind us mentioning him on the podcast, yeah, but. Course. We've been down to the gorge, and he showed us some spots, you know, and we've pulled some – I'm not going to say the name of it. We pulled some permits down yeah, there. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, I mean, he talks about just the stories of being down there and seeing it all. I mean, splash marks all over the cliff walls yeah. of fish yeah. coming up and eating them off right. the walls and just all kinds of stuff happening. Yeah. And it just – it sounds like – one. yeah, it sounds like one of those phenomenons you want – to experience and right. as a fly fisherman or even as an entomologist as somebody yeah. who studies them wants to see it and wants it's, to be around it's cool it cool just to see it you know and those splash marks too you know there's a fish feeding there you know and it's fun just to, to cast up in there and you know there's a fish and you drift it by a few times and you know everything's going to come up at some point and, and i've just, heard people talk about it though too where you know during that hatch it's like a lot of the fish have fed so hard that they're not eating that much and you know they've been down there during a prolific hatch and it's like nothing's really going on the fish aren't feeding that hard and again i haven't experienced it which is a bummer for me but (laughs) yeah i mean i I think it takes them a couple of days right uh for those big stone flies to be flying around and then coming back to the river to lay their eggs and stuff like that and the fish to turn on to them as well you know another thing i worry about too is uh How good they taste. They may not be the tastiest critter on there, you know. Uh, and I, if you ever mess with an adult, right, and sometimes you'll squeeze on them a little bit, they'll actually reflex bleed out of their, uh, they'll just like uh, kind of orange juice will kind of come out of their joints. And I think that's probably a slightly uh, unpleasant right. thing to, you know, reduce some predation, right? But, you know, I, if you're used to fishing, you know, a mayfly hatch or a caddisfly hatch and everything's out in the middle, you know, there are some stoneflies that hit and they'll float down the middle and fish are coming off those. But so many of the ones are off on the side, right. really close to the bank. And, you know, some people may be missing some of those types of aspects. I don't know. I don't go fishing with a lot of other people. Right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well <said>. but, so, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. Do you, do you mind talking about kind of just the life cycle of the same flyer? 
I mean, and just, yeah. I mean, how long it takes, blah, blah, blah you know, and just kind of what, yeah, what to, they do. I'm um, trying to remember most of the time, you know, I think they have a, a two or three year life cycle as a, as a larva living in the river. Um, they're primarily, I know they feed on detritus, dead organic matter. Uh, that's dead organic plant matter for the most part. There is, they do, are a little bit carnivorous too. So I think as they get bigger, they pretty much eat anything. Um, I read something that they they can be cannibalistic as well. Oh yeah, anything that's a carnivore is pretty much a cannibal okay. too. Okay. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> this is new for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you um, know, like even a brown trout. Yeah, it, no, it sees a smaller brown trout. It's that's it's what I was dinner. about to say. You can go ahead and compare to a brown trout. Uh, yeah, and well, just fuck like me, trout, right? <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. like a brown trout, as they become, as they as they get larger, they become more pacifist. Yes, yeah. eating more of their own kind. Obviously. Yeah. So yeah, but but they're not. You know, that that Terranarsis is not going to be a strict carnivore like a golden stonefly or something like that. Go, uh, you know, mature golden stonefly or or Clasenia, that other big stonefly that comes off in August. Then you know, those those are really big carnivores. Those are those are top invertebrate carnivores out there in the river. Uh, Terranarsis, I don't think is quite that much of a, a carnivore. They eat some other stuff, but they, they, you know, I think they eat like the the detritus and stuff as well. Uh, so they're out there doing that, and they have some pretty specific habitat requirements, uh, cobble size, and things like that. And when you find them, you find them, right? If I'm out there with a net and kicking around under the right rock size and stuff like that, you kick up a ton. But if you're off just a little bit in the wrong cobble size or a little bit of sediment, you, you don't get them, right? And then so they're out there, they're feeding, they're doing their thing for a couple of years, and then it becomes time to be an adult. They migrate to the shore, right? You know, a mayfly is going to come off in the middle of the river. Caddisfly is going to come off in the middle of the river. Stoneflies are going to migrate to the bank. And then and that's that, why you usually see all the shucks along the rocks. And exactly. Like okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Like uh, a, a Clasenia, I don't know what the common name of Clasenia is. People around here call them a golden stonefly, but they're not the true golden stonefly. Gotcha. The, the true golden stonefly is Hesper Perla Pacifica, and that comes off in June ish, uh, July, end of June, beginning of July around here. But then Clasenia will come off at the end of July, beginning of August. But they'll come off in rocks in the middle of the river, and they'll start, you know, run around on there, and then they actually walk across the surface of the water at night, right? So they're active in the pitch black. So they tend to be very active on that new moon. Uh, they'll come off, and then they'll run to the bank, and they'll hide under rocks on the on the uh, bank. The salmon flies, they move over to the edge. They come off in the nighttime, you know, and they're crawling up on the rocks on the – willows cottonwoods uh the um box elders you know those types of things they're coming off on on that and they'll hang out a couple of days mature they'll mate stuff like that and you'll just see them just covering on a really good year when those emergences are happening right. and then after that they, they may give them another day or so and you just see these massive waves of them you know on the wind in the afternoons and in the, in the canyons and stuff just just the sky is filled with these just giant wow. uh, uh, stoneflies flying around. People you know? say they look like birds or something <laughs> migrating through. Yeah, and the wind catches them, and you just see these big waves. The sky is just full of them. I mean, it's... Uh, I, you can only just yeah. dream of stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the biggest hatch I've ever seen, I was on the Smith River in Montana, mm -hmm. and this was two years ago because last year it was just blown out. I mean, oh, it was just yeah. mud the whole time. We didn't see a single bug, hardly. But um, the first year I went, I mean, we had March Browns that came off. That you're like, man, this needs to be in a movie. This yeah. is unbelievable. Just I'm mean, just swarms, and I mean, that's a no fly. That just it's oh, a lot yeah. different. But I mean, they're they're not creepy crawly all <laughs> yeah, on top right. of you. And, but, yep. They're just everywhere, just everywhere. clouds. And you just roll around the corner, and all of a sudden there would just be clouds of these things just yeah. moving down river or up river or wherever. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something people, as fishermen we dream about for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons I like stoneflies so much is a, from a if I switch hats and become a fisherman for a moment and uh, fishing uh, uh, an imitation of a big stonefly, is, you know, you can have big, heavy tippet. 
you can you 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 know you, you don't want that we're talking one x two x <laughs> yeah. you don't you don't want that thing just a dead drift either you want it some movement you give it some action you get to play with it a little bit you know and that's what really gets those uh the fish go in and, and it makes it look more realistic you know do you have a favorite stonefly pattern you like to fish as a dry fly that was my next question. <laughs> i don't you don't have to know the name you can describe yeah. it we might know the name <laughs> yeah uh sofa pillows I, you know just a very standard good well tied sofa pillow um and I'm not good at tying. I have some friends that tie some pretty dang good. We need st- to tie. Does st- have some good uh, uh, sofa pillows and stuff. But you know, just a nice heavy bodied ones. Yep. You know, a lot of the ones you buy at the, the at the fly shops are crap. You know, they're really thin. They don't have much feathers. You know, there's not much there, and, and they're hard to find a, a good one. You know, um, you know the foam stuff. It works okay. They, they they hold up. They don't they don't go underwater. You know stuff like foam, that. Foam man, I, but, I tie all of foam. But but, but but they're not beautiful. I'm sorry, yeah. man. But I've seen I've seen some really <laughs> simple, ugly, crappy foam things that work. You know I, they do. Right. You know. Um, well, you also see you see these guys t- tie these immaculate natural yeah. mm-hmm. stone fly patterns, and the truth is they don't, they don't fish any better. Than they don't fish better. They, they don't. They don't, don't fish better than they don't. Relax, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, um, God, just a good Theo stone or a nice golden stone imitation yeah. for a, you know, for a dropper. A lot of times, right. are, are really cool. And you know, that's another thing. I, I like to fish. You know, I have fun fishing a pretty big dry fly, and then which is fun with stone flies. You can throw some really big dry flies, and you can have a good dropper. And, and oh, you're speaking the, to the choir here. Yeah, and the thing and the, and the, and the thing floats, right? Exactly. <laughs> it sounds like we need to go fishing. <laughs> we put you, we put you on some good hopper dropper things yeah, that blow yeah. your mind. But yeah, we've definitely we haven't been together, but um, you know, in this section that I'm talking about, you know, but I'm again, I'm not going to say it just for keeping everything, yeah, yeah, everything yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah. It's already a little blown up, but I'm not going to do yeah. it anymore. But we've, we've gone at separate times to this section of the gorge where we've, I, I told him when it, the first time I went, it was like, man, I'm throwing a hopper dropper, mm-hmm. double pickle below, you know, yeah. and it's just going to hammer fish. And it did. Yep. And I mean, they're coming up and eating the hopper as well. But I told him the same thing. I'm like, dude, you got to throw a hopper dropper with, Double stone flies below it. No, death and, from above. Man. Oh yeah, it's death from above. <laughs> but and he, are you sure? Oh yeah, yeah it's yeah. gonna work. And he went down there at a separate time with a different group. And I mean, the time of his life. I mean, yeah. we'll, Ryan talks about it nonstop. Uh, and Houghton we're Hall, gonna. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go again. But yeah. Um. I mean, with this with this project, I've, if you don't mind mm-hmm. doubling back a little bit, yeah, I, no problem. I'd like to just touch a couple more things that I have written down, but. Um, does fu- like funding for this? Does this come from Western, or is this just kind of on your own dime? What you yeah. wanted? And it, was, wh- it was volunteers. It was uh, you know CPW helped out with uh, uh, you know the boats and uh, some of that type of stuff. Uh, I just got coolers that we have for Western. Um, are you are you planning on doing this? Are you going to plan on keep doing this and try to do it as much and just? <laughs> every year or? yeah it's a, it's a good time for me to go down and the, the stonefly hatch you know i uh can't do it in the park yeah you know, because you can't but on the blm gorge side of stuff the uh, best i can tell and checking on stuff uh and there's not a lot of regulation on insect yeah type of thing which makes it a nice uh functional project for us do you go hike in or yeah i'll go hike in okay. and uh you know i'll fish yeah, for the day definitely. and then you know wait for those females to be uh with a nice egg mass at the end of the day you know walking back out walking back to the truck you know with just, all the volunteers and stuff do you i mean do you well, guys go in at like pleasure park or and then yeah we just mo- went to motor boat up we I mean, went in a jet pl- boat up yeah jet boat up okay but now <clears throat> You know they have the no jet boat regulation stuff, and I don't know, I know that. where that ends and where that does, that where either. that does, where you can and can't go anymore. And I haven't really followed oh, up on it. That, I think that ends at the port. 
Smith Fork, Smith Fork, yeah. Smith Fork or something like yeah. that. So, you know, you can't take a jet boat up as far as you used to be able to. Um, and it's all timing, too, you know. You can get those stone flies as they're more concentrated to the side and things like that. And how's the CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, feel about it? I mean, Yeah, so uh, before I ever started anything, you know, uh, I met good. Uh, with uh, – they're they're admiring their beer. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I met with CBW, met with aquatic biologists around, and, and just so we were all, you know, uh, you know, not to use jargon, but all on the same page, and you know, uh, you know, just to be a good cooperator and a, and a, and a good bi- fellow biologist and things like that, and got some buy-in from them and whatnot on their project, and they've been monitoring. Um, uh, Dan Kowalski out of Montrose has been monitoring the the uh, population dynamics of uh, of the Terranarsis down there too, and I don't know what his dad is. He pulled that off. That project it was originally started by Barry Nearing before he retired and yep. stuff like that. So that kind of rolled over to Kowalski and stuff since then. Yeah, and, and basically what we're talking about, just for people that don't know or don't mm-hmm. know the area, I mean, we're talking about. Gunnison near Gunnison, which yep. I'm the Gunnison River near Gunnison or in Gunnison, uh, in the town site pretty much is where you've been planting or transplanting. Exactly. And then we're talking about below Blue Mesa Dam and down in Gunnison Gorge or Black yeah, which, Canyon. which is below the Black Canyon. Yes. Yeah. So you got you know, and a lot town. of people I think they think of Black Canyon is the same thing as just Gunnison Gorge, but right. it's it's not. At it, all. It's different management jurisdictions. Absolutely. You know, the Black Canyon's managed by the National Park Service. Yeah. Uh, you know, government shut down right now, but <laughs> it leads <laughs> right. that part of it. And then Gunnison Gorge downstream is managed by the BLM. It's national conservation area down there. So, just a tiny bit off topic. Where does the gorge start and Black Canyon end? Oh, good question. We always ask this question. No one. So knows. when you go down, I so I, I have it written down somewhere, but I, so I'm not sure. When you go down um, Chucker Trail, of course. So uh, if you guys out there in the internet world don't know there's a there's a pretty nasty dirt road and then you have to park up at the top and you have to hike down and if you take a boat through the gunnison gorge there's a a horse packer that can pack your rafts and stuff down but there's a trail that goes down there it's called chucker trail we don't recommend it to anybody yeah (laughs) don't go down there (laughs) but if you go down there you and go upstream not that far I think Margaritaville okay. is actually in the park. It's right there. It's right around okay. where Margaritaville is in that ballpark is the Black Canyon. And then downstream from there is the Gunnison Gorge, you know, all the way out to as you pop out there at Pleasure Park. Gotcha. Right. <clears throat> no, it's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So this whole transplant idea, I mean, it, obviously you've been involved with stoneflies for a long time, and that's kind of your passion, obviously, mm-hmm. but... I mean, did this all just stem from you? You're just, hey, I want to do this. This is, this. Is, I mean, uh, is yeah, there other just, sources, or you nah, just I went, mean, yeah, just, this is what I want to do, and I think yeah, we should. Was, you know, it was just that big question of why they're not here. Yeah, right. What? What's yeah, happening? And you talked what, about. I'm not trying to double yeah, act too no, no, far, but, but it's I'm like, just, what, I'm what, just curious. What happened? I mean, why are they not here? Right. And you know, from a an aquatic ecology standpoint. <clears throat> um, is there some like, you, you know, people might think about keystone organisms, ones that if you remove them, they change the system, right? right? Uh, is there such thing as maybe a keystone processor in an aquatic system? Okay. And we don't have a lot of organisms that are called shredders that are that might be in this section of the river and may have been here historically that broke down these leaves and wood and stuff like that. And is there potential for this missing ecosystem step uh, that wouldn't be there that might could process stuff better? Once again, you'd probably have a way better fish population if you got these bigger things coming off. You have better uh, nutrient utilization if that's something that is really missing. Um, did it change the system? Um, and so that's kind of where that kind of came from. And just talking about it with students and, you know, in class and stuff like that a little bit. And, you know, Clayton Bondurant was interested in working on it. So, 
Yeah. Did it, it become kind of a, a class thing or is it like, hey, we're going to go do research and credit or no, no it's just say, like, hey, on your own time, if you want to go with me and no, donate Clay, time. Clayton, or, uh, Clayton took it on as a research project with me and uh, he ran with it and did a lot of historical stuff and, you know, uh, spent his time out in the field and in the uh, analytical chemistry lab. And, you know, he uh, he did a lot of work on it. It was it's pretty cool, you no, know. It's very impressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we I mean we touched on it earlier too about all the stories that we've heard from back in the day mm-hmm. before the dam and everything like that right. and I mean yeah. it it seems as if it was it was something that people came to Gunnison for. Right. Exactly. And that was a big thing and I actually have a paper from a uh an older colleague of mine uh, uh his last name was Knight and he was a uh, he was a doctoral student at Utah, I believe Utah State. I think it was Utah State. Um, and he got the project to survey the Gunnison River for his dissertation prior to the construction of Blue Mesa and then later on Crystal and Morrow Point Dam. So I have all his data, you know, all his dissertation with all his data on where the distribution of all these stoneflies were. Prior to to construction of that, and the bulk of them, even at that point, you know, on those records, uh, they have them up into Gunnison and past the town of Gunnison, um, and how far up and what those population numbers are like, I don't know. <clears throat> we're the ones that made it all the way up to Allmont. Were those just you know migrators upstream, you know? And so, so some of the big questions were was. Um, was the bulk of the population where Blue Mesa is right now. Right. And then we just had these dispersers that came up and they laid their eggs and things like that. And uh, you had those population would slowly go down through time if it wasn't uh, supplemented by the big population under what's now Blue Mesa. Right. So I'm not to get too science jargony, but it's <laughs> metapopulation dynamics. And maybe that was kind of what was happening. And not that you... Element. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe you had these big source populations under where Blue Mesa is that were feeding these other populations up on the Gunnison and Tamichi. Um And then those source populations are gone. And so maybe, you know, after that happened, then we had all this decline. Right. But yeah. So, so just so our listeners are clear, um, was there a direct... Um, was there a direct correlation between the building of Blue Mesa Dam and the disappearance of Taranarsis in the Upper Gunnison? So Blue Mesa was constructed and started filling in 1963, I believe. 62 or 63. I think it was 63. Um, and based on Clayton's interviews and work and stuff like that, the most recent um, you know, hatches of Taranarsis up in this part of the the basin was sometime around 1972 or 73. So 10 years, right? maybe, right? Right. Uh, it could be. Uh, I don't know what the... Right. But I, there could be easily a 10-year buffer of dissipation of the species exactly. until, they were, until they were gone. It, until they were gone. Exactly. But there's not any... It's all anecdotal at this point. There's it's no, all, yeah, it's all anecdotal at this no point. There's no scientific evidence of that dissipation of the species at that point. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. Yeah, we don't really have... You know anything, right? And people weren't looking at it then because you don't not. you don't know when something's about to disappear, right? Right? Uh, you know you can start noticing declines right. and stuff like that, but you right. know no, nobody's paying attention and saying, oh, well, we should figure out this data. Well, and a lot of people, you know, attribute declines to people's hyperbolism in the in the yeah. future. There's like, oh, there used to be so many stoneflies yeah. couldn't breathe. Right. You know, and, yeah. and people are like, oh, well, you know, it wasn't that good. Right. It's just this right. is how it normally is until they're not around any longer. Yeah. And and, say, Holy shit, they were right. Yeah, and people don't seem to notice slow declines, right? It's that general creep, whether it's your health yeah. or whether it's something right. happening in the world, yeah. right? Unless you got this real... Just like a frog in boiling water. Exactly. The the whole analogy from the, the you know, frog in a boiling pot of water. Yeah. Until it's too late. Exactly. Yeah. So... Do we see salmon fly hatches on other tributaries to Blue Mesa or Gunnison River? Are we seeing them? Uh, no comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and can we talk after the interview? <laughs> I'm just curious because 
I have heard is, you know, that some people see him or we yep. have seen him or there are, yep. again, no comment, but I'll just put in my two cents here. But um, I was getting it to it earlier, but we did talk before the podcast a little bit and I've let you kind of go over some notes and I have it written down that I believe I saw adult salmon flies on the East River this mm-hmm. year and you go, did you really? Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? Well, I'm pretty sure, you know, yeah. I'd say I'm 98%, yeah. but I maybe not. Um, and you know, I, the right. first thing I thought of was you, I went, yeah. Oh, it's taking, right. it's happening. Right. This is good. And it could have been right. Um, it, it could have been that salmon fly coming off on the East. And, uh, so for people out there in the internet world, the East river and the Taylor river come together and they form the Gunnison river in this town of Almont, which is well, maybe about 10 miles up, upstream from the town of Gunnison. Um, <clears throat> And so we've been reintroducing them into the appropriate habitat along the Gunnison River. <clears throat> Could they have hatched, we've flown upstream, and, and uh, at, you know, formed some populations on the east? Right. That would be awesome. I hope they did. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, some people have sent me a video or two, you know, on the cell phone type of thing of, of seeing some salmon flies. They were them, you know. Uh, so we've seen a few. I haven't gotten a huge amount of records. Um, it's good to have one in hand. It's kind of like a, a Bigfoot. Yeah, right. <laughs> It'd be it's cool. Like, you, yeah. Oh, I saw a Bigfoot. Yeah, you, okay. Do you want to kill it? You yeah. know, like, do you want or, <laughs> right, How do you right. get the picture where everyone yeah. believes you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You sure that wasn't just a stonefly? You know? Yeah. Well, you know, that's, I, that's what Kevin asked me, because you sure it wasn't right. this like, or that? I'm like, yeah. I don't know yeah. what right. it was. There's some yeah. other species that are pretty big that come off right, exactly. around up here, and they can come off in decent numbers. But, you know, typically the things coming off around here right now in the uh, Gunnison River don't form those big swarms right. flying around on the river. And, and it, if that's what you were seeing, it, it was definitely. I mean, I could describe the experience for you. And it, it was, I was out guiding. Yeah, it was, like it, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, hold on, hold on. I have these really blurry photos yeah. that I need to show you. Yeah. But um, basically, I mean, I, I was out there and it was probably about, you know, 11 o'clock a.m. that it started mm-hmm. happening. And, you know, it was like, it was, I told him it was, it was mid June probably. Um, it's a good time. Yeah. It it seemed right. You know, and I was kind of blown away when they started, whatever it was, if it was salmon flies or not coming off, Uh but it started slow, you know, just a couple here and there. And then there was swarms is what I, you know, and I started looking closely and as a guide, I should know more about it, but I don't. (laughs) And I told you, I was kicking myself in the ass going, why the hell don't I know more about these things to know what exactly it is? What type of stone fly this is, it's definitely a stone, but I mean, a little orangish in color, you know, underneath and, and all of my experience, I was like, this has got to be Sam flies. This is all Kevin Alexander's work right here, you know? And I was, it was, it was a pretty tough day with my client. (laughs) I had a guy I'd never fished before, and oh. all of a sudden these stoneflies are coming off. Never thrown a dry fly before. Oh. It's like, okay, now we're throwing big dries. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do it? And no, it, it yeah, didn't it, happen. It didn't happen. Yeah. It, it was still, yeah, I mean, I caught a lot of fish. But yeah. I showed him how to catch a lot of fish. <laughs> yeah. It, so, you know, in hindsight, just uh, catch one and bring Keep it to it, me. Right. Yeah. Bring it to me. And, uh, Old Bigfoot thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bring me a Bigfoot too. Yeah. yeah if you got a Bigfoot, uh, just. Grab it and, and bring it my way. We'll, and, we'll and get just, we'll get famous. Right. We'll and get just famous. to play devil's advocate against Cameron here, how many how many different species of stonefly do we have in the I was gonna ask that. Yeah, I need I need more microphones. Yeah, uh, <laughs> probably of uh, really big ones that might be flying around. Probably four or five. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Pteranarsis being one of them. Of course. Um, Pteranarsella that comes off, which is a, a genus that's closely, relatively closely related to Pteranarsis. It's a little darker. Um, <clears throat> could have been that, right? Um, anyway. See you, Cameron. Yeah. It really could have been any type of stone <laughs> I wanted to. Yeah, it's a big foot. It's a big yeah. foot. And I, I can't, I can't, my client would have no idea either. Yeah. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, whatever. Your yeah. client probably is going to hear this. Yeah. 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 Doubtful. Take one, put it in the yeah. <laughs> I brought one home. Yeah. Um, I, Robbie, you know, Robbie Cushman, he brought some 
from the gorge one time brought some salmon flies and we were hiking out of the gorge and he put them in a gatorade bottle with mm. some water in there and at the end of this at the end of the hike he got so thirsty he forgot that salmon uh. flies were in the bottom of the gatorade <laughs> bottle ended up drinking all three of them uh. <laughs> well, ask him how they taste. i, I yeah. don't know he almost threw up so <laughs> it can't be that good that's like a cigarette you bought in the beer bottle yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to touch on, on one thing that we did talk about before the podcast. Ryan wasn't here before that, but, um, I mentioned, or you, you saw that our mosquito spraying oh, in Gunnison. Yeah. I'm on it. I'm curious just at overall bug life, not necessarily mm-hmm. stone yep. flies or anything. Cause in my experience, I have been on the river, floating down the river when they have been spraying. Mm-hmm. I mean, airplanes floating through, or yep. I mean, flying down the river, up the yep. river, just spraying you. And I mean, after it just smells like straight deep, pretty much. Yep. It smells like you just got, you took a bath in mosquito spray. Yeah. And I'm just curious. I mean, you can get into anything you want here, but this is definitely something I wanted to touch on. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a good one there. Um, I can't remember the year. This is several years ago. Yeah, I mean, they just stopped, what, like three years ago, maybe, maybe four a years ago? Maybe longer than that. Okay. But there was, a, at one point, you know, Gunnison, there's a mosquito control program here. And I kind of look at the mosquito control program as, uh, you know, if you've never been here, we grow a lot of hay in the basin, and it's all flood irrigated, Right. So it makes some really good mosquito habitat. It really does. You know, this, this nice wet meadows, you keep it lush and green and things are growing. That was another beer there. That, that was Cameron. That's, that's time. part of the podcast. <laughs> I told you, you'd figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> we drink some beer. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of look at that as any type of agricultural pest. I mean, we're, we're really producing some good mosquito habitat and we're growing good hay and things like that. So what, what are you going to do with this, uh, with all these mosquitoes around that we're making really good habitat for? Uh, so there's two components to mosquito control. There is the one that works on the larva that are in the aquatic system. And it's a back, it's a bacteria that is specific to, um, mosquito larva. So um, they're effective only on mosquitoes. And then on top of that, what they were historically doing with the airplane spraying was spraying a chemical called permethrin. Mm -hmm. And permethrin, unfortunately, is not specific. It kills essentially any uh, insect it really comes in contact with. So for what it's worth, you know, the, the planes are good. They, they're, they're flying at a given level. They, they know what the wind speed is at their elevation. They make very specific droplet sizes. And they do these essentially calculations as they're flying to spray so that the spray comes over and they turn it off when they get to specific areas. And they have a very given route and areas that they were going to spray. Apparently, me floating the river was not a specific area. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just like anything else in life, things can go wrong, right? And I don't know what happened that year. Um, I've got all the the maps and stuff of when they where they turned on their sprayer and when they turned off their sprayer and what they were trying to cover and things like that. Um, something happened, right? And obviously, a substantial amount of that ended up hitting the Gunnison River to the point that whatever day that was, I, I can't remember it, but I, my, my cell phone started ringing. Historically, ringing isn't it usually around July 4th just because of the influx of, of tourists, tourists coming yep. into it, town it, it and want to spray yeah, right. so that people aren't pissed off that there's mosquitoes yeah, everywhere just, you know, because and, they, they light, light off the fireworks right by Tamichi river where yep. there's tons of mosquitoes and you know, yep. so it's obnoxious. It, it, it can get obnoxious. Yes. And, uh, so they, they sprayed sometime and sometime around 10 o'clock that morning, my cell phone started ringing <laughs> <laughs> and then, Oh, we got all these dead insects floating down the river. And I, I got a lot of photos and stuff that, that guides have re- really sent me. I mean, 
<clears throat> very disturbing quantities of dead insects. I mean, just I mean, handfuls. I mean, it's just net yeah. netfuls. Yeah, netfuls. And it wasn't you know massive kill off of, die off of stoneflies, but also big large caddisflies, mayflies. I mean, you you look at these photos and you know it, it's just huge masses of dead insects. Just a pl- just a plethora of different. <laughs> Species, subspecies of insects. Yeah, just, yeah, just all aquatic insect, basically, in I don't know what, basically insecticide. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just wiped out. I mean, just right. massive amounts of them. I mean, I, I, I can't get across in, in words exactly the sheer numbers and uh, magnitude of what that die off looked like. Um, so you know, we, we did some surveys and stuff of insects upstream of the uh, spraying and downstream and, you know, night and day difference. I mean, there's a light switch, right. plenty of stuff up here, nothing, nothing down <laughs> here, right? I mean, really, really gone. Wow. Um, good thing is, you know, if you want to look at a good thing here, the insects do a pretty good job of dispersing, right. especially if you have a population upstream and it trickles down and exactly. things like that. So I had students in classes for a couple of years looking at that population recovery and it took a while, <clears throat> but at the same time, there was enough outcry. There was enough outcry from guides. There was enough outcry from TU talking to the county. County looked at it. They talked to us, right. uh, and I designed a, a project. You know, because it's after the fact. You really can't. Um, I really can't. You can't go, go back. I can't go back it. in history yeah. and look at before and after, other than what data we kind of had before right. or. Or, you know, the other way to do a study is immediately upstream and immediately downstream, although that's not perfect. Right, exactly. All right. So uh, for the next year, they were originally going to spray again. And so we set up all – yeah, I got some funding from the county of Gunnison to look at this and set up these studies. And I got a, a, a former student of mine, Corbin Bennett, um, who Corbin uh, ended up going – off to Mississippi and getting his master's degree and he's back in Buena Vista doing some seasonal work for Colorado Parks and Wildlife and looking for a full-time job now. Welcome to the club, buddy. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, But we ended up putting up drift nets, which pick up insects floating downstream, right? So the the whole goal there was if they sprayed again, we would have this monitoring protocol in place and we could look at what kind of impacts would be happening on the river on the spring exactly but at the last minute they decided not to spray again right so which is great yeah don't don't give don't get me wrong that's great but it didn't work for our study very well right so what we did (laughs) was we kept that that thing going and instead of doing an airplane spray one of the things they do now is backpack spraying. Exactly. So or truck spraying. So they'll drive around in a little yep. truck. <coughs> Sorry about that. It was uh, very localized exactly. areas. It's not big massive places. You can deal with, you know, where you're having mosquito adult mosquito issue, right, in, in very specific places. And let me step back for one thing. The bulk of the mosquito control project <coughs> that those people do is the aquatic stage. You know, the, the adult part is less than 10% of the real control. Gotcha. Right. So what you're doing, the larvicide stuff, all, the all-in important stuff. So the adults uh, are minimal. It's just a nuisance control type of thing. So they'll do like a backpack spray. They'll do a, a truck spray, things like that. So we kept our nets out associated with truck spraying, backpack spraying, but no aerial spraying. <coughs> and what we found was, <coughs> sorry, I need to drink a beer here. <laughs> You're right. There you go. Is um, that essentially the communities, the aquatic communities, where the spraying had happened in the past was dramatically different than the areas where spraying hadn't occurred in the past. So we, we found that kind of stuff out. <laughs> all right, thank you. There you go. We got full service right yeah. today here. Water, beer, all of it. Uh, <laughs> so keeping uh, so the, the the 
aquatic systems were dramatically different between where they weren't spraying and where they were, right? So, uh, you know, it wasn't, and I, we reported to the Gunnison County commissioners, it wasn't a nail in the coffin that this was exactly it, but it was highly suggestive. And um, they haven't been pay, paying for the uh, aerial spraying since then. They've, yeah. they've canceled that part of the so project. Just out of curiosity, with the aerial spraying, uh, it, like you said, you, you kind of saw maps and routes that they were taking. Uh -huh. Was it something where instead of just spraying this like uh, wetland area, they actually ended up spraying some kind of riparian zone that made its way? Yeah, uh, so instead of the hay meadow areas or the distinct neighborhoods that they were supposed to spray, right. uh, that maybe the wind picked up, gotcha. maybe droplet size was a little bit off. You know, who, who really knows? You know, I wasn't there. Uh, but if you're around in Gunnison back in the day, right, the planes were around and you'd hear them. You'd, of course. You'd, you'd see them spraying, you know what they were doing. Um, <coughs> and then all the fishing guides for years had said, for what it's worth, whenever they spray, the fishing is always bad. For we always got some of shit to say about yeah. something, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whether you're right or wrong, you got something yeah, to say. Yeah, exactly. We got to put our <laughs> sense in. I, it, now that you're talking about that and just spraying on hay fields and stuff too, but I mean, what about grasshoppers and stuff like that yeah, in there i mean absolutely. because they they thrive yeah. on the hay fields and they thrive yeah. on that so bees well, i mean matter. yeah a lot yeah. of different things bees so. butterflies moths you know uh permethrin is uh and i yeah obviously i'm yeah, just it's thinking a, it's about a, it's a <coughs> yeah all and yeah it kills what it touches right yeah it was. it's a it's a the and uh, maybe not the best analogy it's a nuclear bomb exactly. i mean you're just wiping everything out right, right? it's the what yeah. kind of, what kind of effect does that have on the insects? I mean, just in the future. I mean, is that going to stay yeah. around? Nothing. Like, I mean, I, you know, I, I have to go back and look, but the half life of it isn't a real long half life. I think it breaks down relatively okay. quickly. Uh, but like I said, it, it's it's uh, it's very effective. Yeah. At uh, <laughs> at killing stuff. You well, know, it, it, as long as it's an insect. Right. While yeah. we're, I mean, while we're on the topic of killing bugs, <laughs> yeah. we can talk about it a little bit. You can, again, you can say whatever you want to say or whatnot, but as a guide, obviously we float the river every day. Yep. We see a lot of different things going on every day. Um, you know, and this might not be the question for you. Maybe it's a question for somebody else, but I mean, there's constantly, you know, the way we see it floating down the river every day, we constantly see bulldozers and excavators yep. in the river. We constantly see people moving the river and changing the river and, you know, in my opinion, I've, I've talked to people about it. I've tried talking right, to Army right. Corps. I've tried talking to the CPW. I've tried, and no right. one has anything to say about it. But, I mean, obviously the main thing I think about, you know, if you're doing a project to bring salmon flies back, right. and then here we are just digging up the river and digging right. up rocks and right. stones where these salmon flies live mm -hmm. and, you know, moving the river. What I mean, what's that do? That's yep. not good for it. So, yeah, great, great question. And it, once again, rivers are dis disturbance-dependent systems. So some small amount of that is, is probably not an issue, right? To any large degree, it probably gets worse. I would probably say, and I have some historical maps, and I, w I wish uh, Internet Land, I could, I could show you some of this type of stuff. But... Uh, <clears throat> To me, probably some of the biggest changes have been in that riparian community. The uh, cottonwood forests and things like that that were historically along the river. You know, and I understand it. Uh, people buy a house. They buy a house near the river. They want to look over and they want to see the river. So what do they do? You know, they remove all that vegetation alongside the river. Unfortunately, for an aquatic system, that is the energy driver energy as far as food energy exactly. the, the source of nutrient you know primary source of nutrients and food and production that goes into that river uh without spending a whole semester and in going into yeah, the whole science yeah. of this you can think about this as a forest is a river and a river is a forest right that riparian forest is the river and that river is the riparian forest <clears throat> And that is absolutely critical for keeping that river functional and healthy. 
if you want good fishing, if you want a, a really good, healthy, functional river, uh, you got to kind of keep that type of stuff there. That's that's the primary part. Exactly right. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, aerial photos we have that were flown in the, you know, I can't remember the dates now, but '60s or '70s compared to what we have now. I mean, we're down, we're down. For in that time period, you know, 50 plus percent, 70 percent. Right. And then if you want to think back from when those and aerial you're thinking photos more are t- of what's around the river and all the exactly. trees, and not what's in, in the river, but what's around it, what's around okay. it. Because, well, I can get to and that, that that's too. It, I mean, yeah, we can get yeah. to all of it, but that, that's but something his, for me to understand. Yeah, as well, but historically, where, if you want to think about from the 50s or 60s back to the 1800s, Right, those changes that happened. I mean, right. we we have lost a tremendous amount of the energy driver right. uh, of uh, of the Gunnison River uh, or Tamichi Creek, right? <coughs> and then the stream types that Tamichi Creek and the Gunnison River are what makes holds their structure together is actually the riparian vegetation exactly, right. that's what holds the soils and things now different rivers have and different TU, types TU of things doing work on Tamichi as well with the riparian zones and, yep, and yep. putting in more willows and yep. different stuff and, and, and is, West, that, is that jesse kuthrop is that, yeah, that kuthrop yeah yeah kuthrop yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh uh so colorado parks and wildlife has a little bit of section of it western has a little bit of section County of Gunnison has a little bit of That's the airport, airport, right? That one even has a little chunk, right? I think that's right. that's up towards us here. I think okay. they, they just oh. have an easement. I don't know if they do uh, anything with okay. it, but I know that yeah. Irwin Guides, does. they do have an easement. Just I believe it's before Parlin, I think, to have an okay. easement to fish or something. I don't, right. I'm not sure if they do any but, work on it or whatever. But out of curiosity, but, so are yeah. they working with ranchers protecting this riparian zone, putting up buffers to keep cows yeah. from just trampling the complete... Yeah, and so you know the the pro- few properties that I've got to work with landowners, it's one of the first things we talk about. You know, you still want uh, to be able to grow hay. You still right. want to be able to have cattle access and water exactly. and stuff like that. And like I said, rivers are disturbance dependent. So as long as they, you know, th- those impacts are minimalized and small, you know, that's not a big deal. Right. But if you can keep that riparian zone, you can keep those willows and those alders and things like that. Exactly. The the river and the creek is narrower. It's deeper. It's shaded. It's cooler. You got better food sources, you know, you got all that cool ecological interactions going on. Better and for it, all things living. It's a better, it's and a we, better. We talk yeah. about, I mean, the lower Gunnison a lot. Not yeah. necessarily, I mean, when I say lower Gunnison, I'm talking lower below Gunnison, the town. Yes. You oh, know, just from. Above but, Blue Mason. Yeah, Between just Blue Mason and the exactly, town. Exactly. Yep. And, you know, a lot of it back in the day was lake but if you go from let's say mccabe's lane down to yep. cooper's ranch yep then i mean it's amazing i mean it's there's no no one touches anything You're right and you that's know, the thing yeah. and that's the coolest part about it what what do you say it's a it's a changing mosaic all the yeah, time in that habitat yeah it's great. and it you know year. the bug life is unbelievable yep. down there and the sediments unbelievable down there and everything yep. is the way you look at it from a fishing perspective at least from what how i look at it as a fishing perspective i'm like this is exactly what we want yeah. and when somebody comes in whether it be a landowner or the state or whoever yeah. comes in and changes something mm-hmm on the town stretch or anywhere through there why you know we had trees in the river we had bushes in the river we had things that the fish wanted that the bugs wanted that things were good why are we doing this as coming from the state biologist or from whoever going what what's your concept here i don't get it you know we it, and it's a hard balance because you want to have the fish, you want to have protection for the fish, you want to have structure, you want to have all these things. But you also, now I'm learning now, yes, yeah. we want to have things for bugs, we want right. to have trees, we want to have that, th- all those plants and matter for the bugs yep. as well. And we can't, it's hard to, sometimes right. I can't see a balance between yeah. the both of them and they can't obviously see a balance between yeah. the both of them. Yeah, the beauty of like Never Sink and Cooper's Ranch and stuff like that is you have all that beautiful cottonwood forest along the river. Absolutely. Right? Uh, and then one other thing to think about, and I know this is uh, 
big rocket science, new uh, <laughs> new foundational stuff for the, the world out there. But water flows downstream, right? Uh, and it goes from upstream to downstream. And so what happens upstream and that energy processing and nutrient processing and, you know, that whole ecosystem stuff is moving downstream. So if you affect something upstream, it's going to change the whole dynamic. And it might take several miles for that recovery to happen, exactly. you know, and so that's kind of one of the cool things about, you know, as we, as I mentioned, Never Sink and, uh, and Cooper's Ranch is you have this just beautiful riparian forest on that whole stretch, you know, right there. And as you go upstream, it's still there, but it kind of starts to trickle out a little bit, you know, and you can, you can imagine well, and you start some of the seeing productivity. More houses and you start yeah. seeing more human development and you start seeing more yeah. structure that yeah. humans put in and different things. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what makes it tough. You know, I mean, even through, I, we know, but the Moncrieves area, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all structure built by human and mm-hmm. yes, yeah, some of it works, some of it holds fish, a lot of it holds yeah. big fish, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then you, all of a sudden you see a huge change when you go a mile down river, just a, a mile, a mile and a half down mm-hmm. river. You're like, Holy crap. Is this the same river? Yeah. Are we in the same area? It's the same river. It's the same place. It's just, it's recreation area. It's federal land. It's yeah. not touched. It's yeah. And the only people who do come in I and do anything are the guides. We come in occasionally during after high water and we'll cut down some trees here and there. But most part most of the time we leave all the structure, we leave yeah. everything that needs to be, you know. Yeah. And we'll if we're floating by with clients, we're like, Hey, there's a big tree in the water right yeah, there. Don't yeah. you know, yeah. don't cast there. Like Yeah, and that big tree is important for uh changing the hydrology of the system it's also great because that's a big chunk of food for that whole system to function with and you know it it really bothers me when people start pulling wood out of the river i you know if it's a safety hazard or something i get it and move it or whatever but that is that that's the big cheeseburger right that's uh that's uh, the, the, the food, that's the lunch, that's for that whole and system. a balance, too, because people <laughs> put wood in the river. Putting wood in the river, within, within reason, exactly. is okay. Exactly. Yeah, within yeah. reason, it can be okay. Yeah, it can I've be really people good. cut down full trees and drop them, mm-hmm. fell them into the river, you mm-hmm. know, and you're like, that's going to be a hazard. Right. That's going to yeah. catch a bridge. It's going to do yeah. something that's not right. going to be good. And I, I don't know. I, I struggle with it a lot, thinking yeah. about it. And now as that long we're as it's not a hazard, and, that's good stuff. And I think... You know, probably historically, we had a lot more what's called large woody debris or uh, large woody Sorry. structure that away in, in, the, in, in the river, you know, uh, that we don't have anymore. Um, so having that there, I, th- I think, you know, absolutely important stuff. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we can wrap this up here anytime, mm. but, um, you know, just from my experience we went down and fished the Arkansas a couple of weeks ago, but I was just talking about the Arkansas. the Arkansas. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a great fishing time, but uh, you know, obviously it's winter. But yeah, you know, in the past when I do go over to the Arkansas, I usually like to go over there in April, May, June, while the river here is running high or whatever, and the Arkansas is floatable. What I've noticed. There is just, I mean, the bug life over there is absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And we have, and you know, to say the same word, but we have sane the river, you know, with Mm -hmm. screens and just looked. And it's unbelievable. I mean, caddis the size, I mean, massive caddis, you know, an inch long or something. And you're just, I'm blown away by the bug life over there. And I know they do, they do a lot of work to help that river and just for recreation is the most recreated river River in in the the, country in the country yeah 120 Um, miles of public right it's i now now i think it's like 300 gold medal miles or something i I don't know the length of it but i know they put all that new gold oh there's a ton yeah Yeah. i mean once they got gold medal then it was it just kept going um and i mean you can fish it all the way down into um the gorge down there and i mean yeah. it's it's royal, unbelievable royal yeah the royal gorge i was trying yeah. to think right there I was yeah. like, huh? um i was gonna say flaming but that's not right yeah um the royal gorge down there but just the what i think about most is what we can do as a con- conservation standpoint right. and just as trying to help our system here for bug life for fish for whatever what can we do to make something like that where it's, I mean, it's just, 
And any given, I know that's a hard yeah. question for you to answer. Right. You go, yeah. yeah, this is exactly what you need to do. But right. I think about it constantly because, and I know a lot of us guides do and fishermen and, you know, biologists and everybody think about it. And right. these are hard questions for sure. But I I feel like I, since I, when I came up here 10 years ago, I feel like there was a lot more bug life than there is now. Oh. Okay. That's just that my, that's just my, yeah. that's my look right. on it. It doesn't, because I've definitely, you know, last year when we had low yeah, dry, water, but dry year, we had yeah. amazing caddis hatches yep. throughout yeah. the year. And it was unbelievable. And you're like, man, I've never seen this many caddis before right, right. ever. But then you look at certain bugs and you're like, man, I'm not seeing what right, we used right. to see or whatever. And green, that, green drakes are a, a very typical thing. And I saw maybe sub- two this year, three decline. this year. Yeah. Uh, I have some good data on that. We've had a substantial decline. And in I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that sometime too. I, I have too. no idea about that one, but that's, that's but a, your that's data a big or question. anything. Yeah, I got the data. We'll you up in five years. Yeah, okay, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So. But I mean, what? How can we help as fishermen yeah. as conservation? Well, so let's be good stewards of the. Yeah. Room. Once be again, uh, keep keeping the uh, keeping the watershed healthy and functional will keep the river healthy and functional you know arkansas is a very different type of system than it is yeah for sure i I can't compare the two right i mean a very different type of system different types of canyons uh very different structure than than here we've got this big wide open basins and a large you know big wide landscapes there it's more confined uh it's tougher for big land use to happen around exactly. much of the arkansas and you're in that canyon there's a highway right there but the highway is really probably not going to impact it much unless there's a spill or something because of the geomorphology i know it's a big word <laughs> of uh, the canyon right it, that river's not the <clears throat> What's right next to the river is not necessarily changing the shape of the river. Here, what's happening right next to the river changes the shape and the function of the river. Exactly. Uh, very different types Constantly, of systems. Yeah. yeah, very different types of systems. Uh, you know, big, I mean, big, big, big they, they just put a gas line under the river. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And that, I, I know I'm talking about it, but I, you mm-hmm. know, it's like right. one of those things where, as as somebody who mm-hmm. is works on the river, I look yep. at them and go, "What are you, What the hell are you doing? Yeah. I don't understand." It, it, and they're digging up the river, you know, and it's yeah. like it's a potential threat to your uh, your livelihood, to and, yours, and, to I yeah. mean, to anybody's, well, yeah. you know, and just our but our area where we like is, to be. I mean, this is the issue with civilization. You know, we're mm-hmm. constantly battling between progress and keeping Mother Nature intact. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's just something we deal with on a daily basis. And we're really starting to deal with it here in the Valley yeah. more than we ever have. We haven't done a very good job of it. No. <laughs> we no, really we don't. We've done so that's, pretty... that's the question, yeah. I guess, is how do we do a better job? What, who, yeah. who do we inform? Who do we talk to? Yeah. I mean, and we can, in, but I, as much as this might get out, you know, right. who knows how right. far this podcast will spread. But right. I mean, as people, as as a guide, I mean, I'm always yeah. telling people how to be a steward. I'm always right. teaching people. Yeah. I'm always, you know. And it, that, that's a great, uh, great role, just having people understanding. So most people don't understand rivers. They really don't. They really have no Most idea. people think they go in a circle. They're like, oh, <laughs> exactly. we're going to end up back here, right? Exactly. Like, like, yeah. No, it's not, a, it's not a lazy river. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, they don't really don't get understand it's a hard con- concept to understand how a river works i mean that is really a challenging right. thing for your average person to pick up um you know but w- what i can you know what what i try to talk to my students about what i talk to my kids about things like that is you know just you can't be an asshole right <laughs> but you but, can say asshole uh, okay. you can say it but you, you know you need to be uh engaged in your community you need to be participatory uh, people need to be able to trust you so that you can you can uh, <clears throat> talk intelligently and really make a, a an informed uh, comment and, and working with planners and your community so that people understand those types of things. Uh, you can't. I mean, people do. People pontificate all the time. Right, but pontificators all of a sudden, you know, end up being expo- exposed because that did, really didn't hold true, right? That really wasn't it. And then so once again, then you lost credibility, and yeah. you lost everybody else associated with you lost credibility. Exactly right. But if you come in informed, you, you make some in, uh, 
you develop some relationships, uh, you work with other people, then people understand, you can get your point across, you can end up making the world a better place. I mean, there's definitely groups we can be involved in too. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, backcountry hunters and anglers and Trout Unlimited and all these different people. DU. And, you know, those people do such a great job. I mean, they have some really spectacular people working for them, doing good stuff and representing them. And the more I've interacted with them, the more I understand exactly from, you know, uh, uh, getting the message out that this stuff's important, right? Yeah. Uh, they, they, they do a fantastic job of that type of stuff. And uh, they, they have people working really hard. You know, uh, I, I see these people, I work with them, I interact, you know, they're they're working their ass oh, off. Yeah. They really are. And I mean, as, they're busy, as, as volunteers engaged. too, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean. Yeah, and be involved in that type of stuff and under, understand really what's happening. Uh, and being willing to, you know, learn and figure stuff out, right? Use use your big brains to, yeah. to, 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 to figure things <laughs> out, that. stuff like that. So, yeah. Use your brains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Do you yeah. have anything you want to talk about that you want to cover? We've covered a lot so far, and we went off topic yeah. quite a bit. But We've been all, all right. over the place. We have. Yeah. That's all right. That's that's what it's meant for. I mean, jumping around, obviously, here's – right, We this is usually where you end it. But I do have a couple questions just for the fishermen. Sure. For instance, uh, an adult stonefly, um, before they come to the bank and hatch out, right. how, exactly do, how exactly does that stonefly behave? Oh, it's, it's on a migration. Just like uh, – <clears throat> um, just like a elk or a deer trying to get from one place to another when it's time to be up high feeding on grass during the summer and snows are about to come and it needs to follow that down and, and get out of the deep snow and things like that. <clears throat> they're migrating. They're moving. They're active, right? Uh, <clears throat> during the rest of the year, they're underneath rocks. They're hiding out. They're, they're not really good <clears throat> things to imitate. Right? right, because they're tucked in there. Right. They're they're hunting for food. They're down in the rocks. But that's the beauty, you know. It's just like maybe hunting the rut uh, for deer or elk or something like that. <clears throat> the, all of a sudden, they're moving, man. They're getting ready. They're migrating to the edge. I need to be over there. Right. I need to, you know, find me a, a dude or a lady, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. I mean, because that's they're not feeding it as right. an adult. They're just moving over. They're active, and that's why it's that that's that's a good time to to f- fish for them. You know? Gotcha. You know, to do um, that casting and stuff like that. And uh, one more question, and obviously this is for the listener. What so when when a stonefly does hatch out? Yeah. Um, what's the general life stage at that point? How long do they live from hatch? To, oh, till they mate and die. Um, it's a good question. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. It's probably under a week. Okay. Right. You know, <clears throat> there are mayflies that, as an adult, might live an hour. Yeah. Ooh, pop yes. quiz camera. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Do you know what that is? No. Uh, most mayflies are born where they hatch out into their adult form without mouths. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Well, they, they have mouths, but they're non-functional. Right. And a lot of the stoneflies are too. Some stoneflies will feed on some like sap and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, maybe some of the pollen and stuff. But, uh, you know, a lot of them are non, non-feeding and they, they might live a week or two weeks as an adult. Right. But not very long. And so they're burning up their energy that they uh, uh, got as a larva living in the river eating there and so now they're just up hunting down a mate uh making little baby stoneflies you know and that's it (laughs) same thing the same thing with the mayfly you know and there's some mayflies mayflies will live you know a day two days in an adult um some of maybe a couple of days but they're they're very short-lived as an adult that's where the name comes from ephemero is ephemeral so the the order for mayflies is ephemeroptera, terra, terra is wing, yeah, and ephemero is uh, short lived. So short lived on the wing, 
So they only live for you know a day or two as an adult. This might be the most educational podcast we've ever had. <laughs> so there you go, Fly Fisherman. Yeah. I'm, Learn Latin. I'm <laughs> blown away right now. I'll say that much. I didn't know yeah. what I was getting into. Yeah. But I'm blown Apologize away. Apologize right for no, hitting no, you at no. all. It, it's awesome. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> Nerding out here a little bit. Oh, I'm on a, yeah. <laughs> it's good. No, no, it's it's good. That's why I wanted to have you on. I mean, it's good mm. just knowing all these things and as fishermen or as just people in general knowing yeah. these things and just knowing what what you can do or what yeah. what's out there i mean yeah. a lot of people don't get away from their homes or their computers right. or their phones or yeah. whatever and when we get to take somebody out on a guide trip and yeah. take them fishing and we get to teach them certain things and a lot of this stuff i, I might share you know yeah, just, just i'm not gonna know yeah. all the words i might make something yeah. up but <laughs> you know i'll share a lot of this stuff uh, with I people you guys do anyways yeah. oh, but you know that's kind of the the beauty of, <laughs> of fishing and stuff you get to interact with the world in a very different way than you normally do on a daily basis and it, as a guide you know you got this uh uh, privilege and responsibility for helping other people Absolutely. being able to learn about how to interact with the world right definitely i cool. mean that's that's what it is i yeah so do i <laughs> we gotta pee um we're gonna end it here kevin i want to thank you so much All for right. coming out um <laughs> drinking a couple beers with us and talking bugs and just talking about what we can do um so i appreciate it man thank yep. you no problem. Ryan, Enjoyed it. Thanks, it was a blast. thanks for having you as well. Ton, ah, tons of fun. Couldn't, couldn't be happier. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, guys. Yeah.